Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Josh Willis, and I'm a climate scientist. Um, but uh, I'm not here to rescue you, sorry. Uh, but I will tell a few jokes, and maybe we'll have some fun and learn a few things along the way. Uh, climate change is very serious business. But lucky for you, I'm not a very serious person. So uh, I'm going to try and make this fun. Um, and uh, this is something that I've been trying to do for quite a while. Uh, about 10 years ago, I took a, an improv class uh, at the Second City in Hollywood here. And uh, ever since, I've been trying to learn better ways to talk about this very serious subject. And so what I hope to do today is give you a little taste of both of those things. So uh, this is me um, in my favorite sweatshirt uh, with all the little NASA bubbles all over it. Um, and uh, this was taken on the day that, um, or a couple days before we launched the most recent uh, satellite to measure global sea level rise uh, called Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich. And uh, that's me holding on to the rocket that was to carry it to space there. Uh, it was a SpaceX rocket. And um, these missions that measure sea level, they have a long history going all the way back to the early 1990s. And in 2016, we, we launched our first one on a SpaceX rocket. The name of that mission was called Jason-3. And I was, uh, even then, the uh, lead NASA scientist for these missions. And I got to do a press conference um, before the mission was launched. And it was the first time SpaceX had tried to land one of its rockets on, uh, on a, a, a platform at, uh, at sea. And so everyone was almost more excited about the rocket landing than they were about, uh, about the climate change and the sea level rise that we were measuring. And so uh, this is what happened at that press conference. We'll take questions now, and we'll start right here. Uh, can or will you guys uh, care to comment on the uh, launch vehicle? But I will say that we're excited to get a ride to space, uh, and we hope SpaceX breaks a leg. really did happen to me. Um, I really did say that. Uh, I was lucky enough, actually, to go to SpaceX earlier this year. Uh, we were working on another project with them. And I actually met the young man who was in charge of investigating why that leg broke. Uh, and uh, he told me he had to spend a long, uncomfortable few hours in the room with Elon Musk explaining what happened. Uh, but um, And he knew all about my video. He had seen it before. Someone had showed it to him. But uh, uh, they actually fixed that problem. They figured out what it was. Uh, and the very next rocket landed successfully. Uh, and they've been recovering these rockets ever since. And it's kind of an interesting story, because uh, the cost of the rocket that we would have taken on that mission was about $200 million. And the cost of a SpaceX rocket was $60 million. So it was such an enormous you know, cost savings to uh, recover those things. Um, that was really uh, kind of an amazing, an amazing fact to me. But I, I show this video in part because um, I, I like to make fun of myself, and I like to, uh, I like to inject a little bit of, of my own art into this science, which is so, uh, so serious. Um, I like to laugh, and I like to ha have other people laugh, um, especially laugh at me, as you can tell. And uh, so hopefully we'll have a few more of those along the way. Um, but what I want to tell you about a little bit more is these missions that measure sea level rise. So these missions look down from space, and they actually uh, measure how tall the ocean is. And of course, the ocean is getting deeper every day. It's getting taller every day. And the satellites work by simply bouncing a radar wave off the surface of the ocean and measuring how long it takes to go down and come back up. And they make a few corrections for other things. Uh, but that's the basics of it. You know the position of the satellite very accurately. You know how far it is down to the sea surface. And that can tell you how high the oceans are. And these satellites, they cover the entire globe about once every 10 days. So every 10 days, 
we get a measurement of the sort of state of the oceans, the height of the oceans everywhere in the world. And with these, we can actually measure the average height of the oceans with an accuracy of about half of a centimeter once every 10 days, uh, which is an incredible technological feat. And these satellites were actually not made to measure sea level. They were made, uh, or sea level rise, they were made to measure things in the ocean like this, which is a giant El Nino happening in 2015, which uh, changes weather patterns all around the world. And these red colors show where the sea level is high, blue show where it's low. And these have to do with the movement of heat throughout the ocean. And that heat connects the oceans to the atmosphere, it changes the climate, and ultimately the weather that we experience. So these huge global phenomena are things that we measure with these satellites. And they were really what they were intended to do. Um, but these satellites, which first were launched in 1992, were so accurate that they could actually measure this global sea level rise and give us a global picture of the oceans, um, which is very important because the oceans are rising. Uh, if, you, if you've known anything about climate change, you're probably aware that the Earth is heating up. And as the planet warms, the oceans rise. And this rise is charted by these missions so accurately that we can see things like this, uh, this chart, which shows the rise of the oceans over the last 30 years. And what you can see is this steady up and down of the oceans uh, as a whole. So every year, the atmosphere evaporates water out of the oceans. It rains that water back down on land, and it, it removes some water from the ocean. So this up and down is actually the exchange of water between the oceans and the land. And so in that way, it's a lot like the heartbeat of the planet. You can think of it as the water circulating around like the circulation system of our entire planet, uh, and these satellites allow us to measure its heartbeat. But of course, the most striking thing in this graph is that over time, it's rising. And this rise, which is now 10 centimeters over the course of the last 30 years, is 10 times bigger than the yearly exchange of water between the oceans and the land. So by this measure, human-caused climate change is actually 10 times bigger in the last 30 years than the natural cycles that we see in the oceans. So it's a very powerful tool for telling us what's going on with the climate. So I mentioned climate change, and of course, the oceans are heating up, and the planet is heating up. And we have these records going back about 150 years uh, to tell us how the temperatures of the planet have changed. And they're rising. We, we know this. This is well known. It's been well known and well documented for decades. Um, this means that the planet is heating up. And why is that happening? Um, well, essentially, the Earth gets all of the heat that it needs from the sun. So this energy from the sun, it lights the Earth. And most of this energy passes right through the atmosphere. It goes through the air. Uh, it, it warms the surface of the Earth. And in that warm surface of the Earth, it sends energy back out into space. And in normal times, the planet is in equilibrium. So the amount of energy coming in is equal to the amount of energy going out. But right now, what we've done is we've changed the atmosphere. And the outgoing energy is getting trapped. And so the question is, what happens to that outgoing energy? What happens to the heat? The answer is that over 90% of it winds up warming the oceans. So the oceans are actually absorbing not just the extra water from the melting of the glaciers and the ice sheets. They're also absorbing almost all of the heat that we trap with the greenhouse gases. So when we think about climate change, we think about it often happening in the atmosphere, but really, almost all of it is happening in the oceans. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to study the oceans and why I think studying the oceans is such an important part of how understanding how humans are changing the climate. So I mentioned this in addition to the oceans warming, um, the ice is warming as well. Ice uh, and glaciers all over the planet, over 90% of all glaciers on the planet are in retreat. Uh, and this one in Alaska is very similar to glaciers all over Greenland and all over the world. Um, on the left, you have a picture from 1941. And on the right, you have a picture from 2004. Uh, and you can see that the glacier has retreated 
um, all the way up this canyon, miles and miles up this canyon. And this is very common. Uh, as the planet warms, the air uh, heats up, um, you get more melt than you get snowfall on these places, and it eventually causes them to retreat. Uh, but this happens also on a much larger scale in Greenland. Uh, this is an island covered with two miles of ice. There's enough ice here to raise sea levels by almost 25 feet if it were all to melt today. And we measure from space the loss of this ice using a pair of satellites called the GRACE satellites. Uh, these are fun. They actually chase each other around. Um, their names are Tom and Jerry. And whenever the first one goes over something heavy, it speeds up a little bit and it pulls away. And when the second one follows, it chases and catches up. And so by measuring the distance between these satellites, you can effectively weigh the continents. And when we weigh Greenland, we find that Greenland's ice is disappearing. It's losing mass. And you can see in this image that a lot of this mass loss, the places that are red around Greenland, are happening around the edges, the places where the ice actually reaches out and it touches the oceans directly. And uh, this was sort of the genesis of our idea for launching a mission to try and understand how the oceans might be affecting the ice from below. Um, and that uh, mission was called Oceans Melting Greenland, or OMG for short. Uh, and this is just a short video to introduce the mission, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. There's enough ice here in Greenland to raise sea levels by 25 feet all the way around the world. It's an incredible amount of ice, and it's melting and adding to sea level rise. For oceans melting Greenland, what we really want to do is measure the oceans, measure the ice, and watch them change together year on year, and try and answer the question, how much are the oceans melting away the ice, as opposed to the air, which is what most people have studied so far. It's really a breathtaking landscape. These giant mountains and uh, canyons are all along the coast. When you look out the window, you really get a sense of just how huge these glaciers are, these gigantic rivers of ice that are draining the ice out of Greenland into the ocean. And then they reach the ocean and it gets all broken and craggy and big chunks fall off. It's incredibly dramatic. Kulasuk is just a tiny little town in southeast Greenland and we've been launching probes out of here for the past four or five days. It's already been a fantastic year for OMG measuring the oceans. We launch them right out of this tube right over here. Open up the tube, you can look right down and see the water passing by, or sometimes the icebergs or clouds or whatever it is we're flying over. We slow down a little bit and we just push these big gray cylinders at the bottom of the plane and they fall to the ocean and measure the temperature and salinity when they get there and radio it back to the plane. We're really trying to look at the ice and ocean all the way around. So we're dropping 250 profilers. We're going to cover uh, the coastline all the way around. And in the spring, we map out the glaciers with a uh, radar also all the way around. So we're really looking at mapping all of the ocean ice interactions in Greenland as best we can with one mission. Yeah, so that's a little uh, intro to OMG. And um, this is a, a mission that really um, took over my life for pretty much the last 10 years. Uh, I started um, writing the proposal for this mission. Around the same time, I took my first improv class, which you might be able to guess by the name of the mission, OMG. Uh, and um, it really came together as an attempt to try and understand uh, how quickly the ice in Greenland is going to melt. Because that's a huge impact on our future, our coastline right here. Every ton of ice that's lost in Greenland raises sea levels on our coast and every coast around the world. And we really don't have a good concept um, as a science community of how quickly this can happen. We know it's happening, we know it's caused by people, but how fast can it really go? How threatened are we by this ice? And OMG came together as a, a, a 
five-year-long mission and then eventually six-year-long mission. And we finally concluded at the end of last year. Um, we went to Greenland every year for six years, including through the pandemic, which you can see me getting a COVID test right there. Uh, I was very happy to say no one on the mission ever got COVID while we were there. It was great. Um, but uh, we operated there for many years, and the goal was to try and understand how the oceans were changing and how the ice were cha was changing. And by watching them change together, we could better understand how the oceans would drive the ice loss. And uh, you might wonder, how is the ocean connected to the ice? The uh, uh, oceans are actually connected to the ice through the edges of these glaciers, which reach right into the oceans and feel the changes in the seawater. So if you look all the way at the edge of this picture, you'll see a glacier coming down through a fjord and cut away, uh, uh, cut away through the fjord. You can see that the ocean water reaches, to the, reaches the glacier edge. And these glaciers sometimes sit in hundreds of meters of water, which is really incredible. If you're flying over them or you look down, you see these uh, you know, thousand foot uh, mountains sloping down into the, into the ocean or into the, behind the ice. And the interesting thing is those, that trough, that fjord, it's as deep below the surface of the water as it is above the surface of the water. So there can be a thousand feet or 2,000 feet of, of ocean reaching the edge of this glacier. And often the glaciers in Greenland break off in a vertical wall, just like this one shown here. And the water around Greenland is interesting too. It's actually what I call upside down. There's a layer of cold water at the surface and a layer of warm water down deep. And the reason the warm water is deep is because it's very salty. It's from the Atlantic Ocean. And the salt actually makes the warm water so heavy that it sits below this layer of cold water from the Arctic. So the water that's actually eating away at the edge of the ice is hidden from us by this layer a couple hundred meters thick, hundreds of feet thick, of cold water that's sort of making the, the machinations of the ocean and glacier invisible to us by any other means except dropping a thermometer into the water and measuring it directly. And that's exactly what we did for OMG. Uh, we dropped more than a thousand of these instruments in the waters around Greenland, measuring how the oceans were changing over time. And what we found was that the oceans actually uh, were driving quite a lot of the ice loss in Greenland. We, we got to fly over places like this uh, in northeast Greenland. Uh, this is the edge of a glacier. You can see in this image, which shows the airplane wing, this ice wall that's sitting out there. Um, everything to this side of the ice wall is actually floating broken chunks of ice. And there's this huge brown pool. And that pool is a place where uh, water is coming out from underneath the glacier, rising up the face of the glacier, carrying a lot of dirt and silt and other stuff with it, um, and making this kind of roiling uh, uh, pool at the edge of the glacier. And we were able to actually drop a temperature probe through that and measure how it changed as a function of, of depth. And so with all these measurements, um, you can see on the left this map where we took a couple hundred of these kinds of measurements every year. We were able to piece together this story of how the oceans are driving ice loss in Greenland. And the answer was they're driving a lot of the ice loss. In fact, the glaciers to a large extent are really controlled by what the ocean is doing. Now remember at the beginning of the talk, I said that the oceans are absorbing over 90% of the heat trapped by greenhouse gases. So we know in the long runs, the fate of the oceans is to warm. And that means that the fate of the glaciers is to retreat. Um, that was heavy, so I'm going to show this video of, uh, of us flying past an iceberg, which is neat. Um, this iceberg was so tall, you can see right there, that as we flew past, it's higher than the edge of the wing. So we flew past many of these icebergs at a few hundred feet of elevation, and they were actually taller than the airplane. Um, so it was really a dramatic place, but these icebergs are a reminder of how these glaciers break off ice and give up ice to the oceans and drive sea levels higher uh, around the world. Um, this is kind of a complicated result, but basically it says that as the oceans warm, the ice retreats more quickly. And then as the oceans go through natural cycles and they cool off a little bit, which do, does happen in the oceans around Greenland, the glaciers slow their retreat. 
And so literally the glaciers are just following this rhythm of the ocean. And because we know in the long run the oceans will warm, we know in the long run the glaciers will continue to retreat. So I want to end with one last uh, little video here um, because, uh, as I said, I really enjoy talking about climate change, and I'm going to stop with a few minutes so that you can ask me questions about climate change. Uh, but I also enjoy uh, 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 a little bit of fun, as you can tell from my talk. Uh, and so this video is one that I made a couple years ago with some friends. Um, it was actually as part of a contest. There was a contest put on by the ALDA Center for Science Communications, and they, uh, they asked the question, um, what is climate? And this video is made in the answer, in answer to that question. What is climate? A question actually asked by an 11 year old. Hello there, little lady. Say, what's climate? Well, you curious little ankle biter. Climate is the generally prevailing weather conditions, including temperature, precipitation, humidity, Wind, cloudiness, as a function of time throughout the year, composited over many years. What? Let me try something a little different. <laughs> Sunday on Sunday, high seven day three. Monday rain was pouring down on me. Tuesday was cold, I almost froze my toes. Oh, what's it gonna be next week? Who knows? That's weather. Oh, that's the weather you got. That's the end of that. If you want to see the rest of the Climate Elvis video, Google Climate Elvis. Uh, again, my name is Josh Willis, AKA Climate Elvis. Just remember the sideburns. And if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you.